Welcome back to ChipReport.tv. I'm Chris Gamble of Chris Gamble's Analog Life and the App Hour Podcast. This week, we're back to the big boys. Yeah, the past couple weeks, we've been covering some not-so-huge semiconductor companies. But, as they tend to do, the big companies have been putting out lots of chips, and some of them are kind of exciting this week. So, we're going to go back. I don't really favor you know one company over another, but whoever's putting out the most chips usually gets the most attention. And... As, the, as it goes, the biggest companies usually put out the most chips. So, let's dive right in. First up is the CC2564 from Texas Instruments. And this is probably one of the more exciting chips that I've seen in a while. Not because it's doing anything unusual, it's a Bluetooth chip, but because of the combination of what it does, how much it costs, and just the accessibility of it all, uh, this has the potential to really open up a lot of markets for, well, hold on, for uh, this thing. Turns out that uh, just about every device has Bluetooth. And as I enjoy talking about, uh, every cell phone that has Bluetooth also has something very prominent, every smartphone that is, a screen. Which means now you can make a widget, and the widget can talk to the screen, and you don't need you don't need a screen on your device anymore. And that really changes the game for a lot of things. Granted, it's not going to fix everything, right? You're not going to necessarily want to use your phone for a high-end piece of test equipment. But maybe a tablet. Maybe another device. Maybe you want to just talk between devices. Really, just in terms of connecting up electronics, Bluetooth, which had a relatively slow start, in my opinion, uh, it's it's everywhere now. I mean, it's, it's unavoidable. And the increasing data rates that are coming from Bluetooth, this chip happens to be Bluetooth 4.0, uh, it makes it more and more of an attractive option. The low, low power option of Bluetooth as well, I mean, that really helps with battery life and the, the overall quality of how you're actually transferring data from one embedded device to another. I don't mind using this thing for a lot of stuff. So what does this thing have? Uh, Basically, it is the Mac of the Bluetooth world. So if you think about it in terms of Ethernet, right? Today, you can buy a Mac, a discrete Mac. You can buy a discrete Phi, Mac being the processing area, the Phi being what actually turns that into a signal that then drives a transformer on an Ethernet, um, on an Ethernet uh, line. This is basically the equivalent of that. So this is the Mac and the Phi, and basically, uh, now, instead of having a transformer inside of an Ethernet RJ45 jack, you're going to have an antenna and, well, a low-pass filter in front of that. So that's really nice because you're abstracting it out. Now, I'm not saying this isn't possible already. In fact, uh, there's a wide range of Bluetooth modules that are out there. One that comes to mind is the SPBT2632 from ST Micro. And there's, there's a ton out there. There's third-party companies. There's chip vendors that actually do modules. But the key there is, those are expensive, quite expensive. And this is not. I mean, it is, well, let's go right to it. This is, in 1K quantities, this part is $2.14. Which means that you're not going to get away with just adding this. Obviously, you need to add a filter at the output, and you need to also add an antenna. But if you design some of that stuff in your board, you use lower cost components, if you don't care as much about signal range, so much as low cost, low power, then you can really get a cheap Bluetooth solution. Now, it is worth mentioning that this is not a standalone solution, as some of those modules are. I, I, I believe with some of those modules, you can just pass it spy signals or uh, UART signals, and it, it just cranks out your Bluetooth data. And that is very convenient. With this, you actually do need a Bluetooth stack. But TI being the huge company that it is, they also have included stacks with the MSP430 and the Stellaris platforms. So you can just hook this thing up and off you go. In terms of size, it's uh, pretty small. It's about 8x8 QFN. Uh, it's a 0.6 millimeter pitch, so it's really getting down there. And uh, that's 76 pins. So I really like this chip. I, I'm really excited about it. I'm going to try and put it into some of my designs. Um, the only the other thing, and the other thing that modules usually went out over, is modules are usually already configured for FCC certification. Now, you still have to do some level of certification, I believe, if you're going to actually be reselling the product that you put a module into. 
But in this case, I believe you're going to need a, a, a higher level of certification because you're actually doing more of the ecosystem. You're actually putting in the antenna and everything else. So double check into that before you actually design this in because that actually can be a significant cost adder and that's actually what's designed into a lot of those modules. So I'm excited about it and I hope to see it in a lot of new projects. Next up is the LT8300. And this is an isolated flyback controller for creating isolated power supplies. So to start off, let's just get it out of the way. You do need external magnetics for this part. So much like a lot of other DC to DC converters, you do need some kind of magnetics to you know, act as the flywheel. And not, not only in the flywheel, but in this case, it actually is isolating as well. It's actually charging the core of a transformer and then is passing power over that transformer to the other side. And that's actually what creates the isolation. Okay, so that's out of the way. Yes, there is a transformer, but there's tons of off-the-shelf components that are available for this kind of thing, many of which are actually mentioned in the app note. So the thing that's really cool about this is, first off, it's a 100-volt part, so you can do up to 100 volts in, which is pretty, pretty impressive in its own right. But the thing I really like about this part, and a couple other parts in this family, is it doesn't require any third winding. Now, what that means is most flyback transformers, you not only need to you know, excite the coil on a transformer, you also need to actually have some kind of readback so you know that, okay, you're, you're doing a little blip on the primary side. Well, on the secondary side, that's creating a, you know, a different type of blip, if you will. And not only that, it's, it's then you're, you're smoothing it out with ripple caps and uh, diodes and everything else and rectification. And then you want to actually feed that back to the controller so it knows, okay, well, that's the right amount of ripple. That's effectively the idea behind the, the feedback system in a flyback controller. Well, the limiting factor in that a lot of times is with a, with a normal flyback controller, you need to either use the third winding, so you're actually monitoring the core and seeing how much, how much the core is moving around, and you can, you can extrapolate that. Or you need to have some kind of opto to actually feed back the DC voltage that you're uh, creating on the other side. And you put that into a feedback pin, and that actually then ends up controlling the, the regulator itself. So the feedback comes back into the chip, and once it's in the chip, it actually changes behavior on the output of the controller, which then affects the, the transformer, which then affects the secondary, and it all loops back around again. They call it a controller loop for a reason, right? It's looping around. So all that said, um, it can get pretty, pretty involved with flyback controllers. Now, there's a lot of reasons to do them, isolation being one of the, one of the main reasons. But uh, for a long time, you really that was what you had to do. You had to feed back the voltage somehow, either through the... You know, through the transformer or through an opto or some other kind of isolation method. Well, the cool thing about this thing is not only is it 100 volts in, it also doesn't require a third winding, which I really, really like. And basically what it's doing is it's watching that output pin. So it's not only out outputting current, or actually it's pulling down on the input voltage line with a, with a MOSFET. But once it's actually doing that, it watches for specific behaviors because of... Uh, because once you hit the zero point on the secondary side, you see spikes on the primary side. And, and basically watching that profile, it can recognize uh, you know, how, how you're doing on the secondary side in the simplest terms. And one, once you have that data, once you, once you feed that back into the chip, it can actually modify itself. And the control loop then moves to the primary side only. The important thing is it's a simple way of getting an isolated transformer, an isolated power. And, and basically the only limiting thing then is how much isolation you have in your transformer. So bigger transformer, better isolation between the windings, you can get thousands of volts of isolation. And that's really great because that what that means is then you can, you know, from the primary side, we're actually generating this power to the secondary side, you can actually float the secondary side up, you know, many hundreds of volts. And that's that's the benefit of it. So you know you know if you're in an application where you don't know what, you know, a sensor side might might what voltage it might be at, if you're worried about um, you know, voltages, stray voltages, actually pushing, pushing your stuff around. If you didn't have this isolation in there, basically what happens is if you connect your ground to that, then it's going to short through whatever the ground is connected to and you're going to blow something up. So this, this voltage isolation really allows you to protect your circuits and also to do some cool stuff when you're doing floating electronics. Other cool things about this. This is, you can tell from LT, so it's LT8300, not LTC, and I learned that means it's a bipolar process. If it was a CMOS process, it would be LTC. So uh, this is a, a nice beefy uh, BJT transistor in there, basically, that's actually acting on that input voltage line. And it can do 150 volts on that switch 
and it can carry up to 250, 260 milliamps. And that's important because the flyback is that, that peaking action I mentioned before, uh, that can actually spike up a lot higher than what your input voltage is. So you could have a 20 volt input voltage, but depending on the turns ratio, you could have you know, up to a, a 100 volts um, of, a, of a peak. And if your switch can't handle that, then the whole controller is going to fail. So it's really important that you know, it, it, uh, it has that kind of voltage standoff in that, in that switch that's actually pulling in on that, that voltage line. Uh, what, else, uh, what else does it have? It has a, a load regulation to less than a half percent, which is pretty good considering you don't have any other kind of feedback other than the uh, primary side uh, ripple watch, basically. Um, low quiescent current, that's pretty standard these days, but uh, 70 microamps in sleep mode, which is pretty cool. Um, and actually only 300 microamps in active mode. So this thing actually isn't pulling, doesn't take much power on its own, so it's not going to hit your efficiencies that much. All that efficiency is really going to be lost in the transformer and in uh, in your switching losses. And then finally, uh, boundary it has a boundary mode, and what that does is it basically changes the the switching mode so that when you have a light load on the secondary side, it actually can sense that and it can change its algorithm in order to uh, not oversaturate the transformer and to basically you know try and even out your efficiencies a little bit. So all in all, this is a great little package. TSOT 23 five pin package. It's tiny, uh, very few pins. It's settable with a resistor. The voltage output is. Um, there are more complicated parts, but this one is very simple um, and very cool, to be honest. Um, so if you have any kind of need for um, isolated up to upwards of 100 volts input and upwards of two watts, if you have any kind of needs for that kind of thing, I really suggest this part. Uh, let's see what the price is. I think it was about yeah, about 350 and 1K pricing based on their website. It's available now, and um, I think it's really going to be a cool part in the applications where it's needed. Last up is the Max 5318 from Maxim Integrated. <laughs> Maxim recently changed their name, and now they are Maxim Integrated. I forget, I think they were Maxim Semiconductor before, maybe something else. Um, but they're making good here, actually. Um, this is a 18-bit high accuracy DAC. It's a voltage output DAC and SPI interface. And the reason I'm saying they're making good on it is this thing's got a pretty good chunk of stuff in there. Um, you know, there's a there's a bunch of control logic. There's a SPI interface, which isn't that stand, uh, you know, not that crazy for DAC or an ADC. Um, but it also has that DAC is internal. It's got internal resi match resistors. There's an output buffer. Tons of stuff actually internal to this thing. Basically, all you need to do is hook up a micro and then probably hook it up to some kind of amplifier in the output, and then you're ready to go. And 18 bits is nothing to snort at. I mean, this is, uh, this is meant for high-end markets. I mean, they're talking about medical imaging. They're talking about uh, test equipment, which is a love of mine. They're talking about industrial equipment, another love of mine. Um, you know, really, this is, this is meant for the high-end, and, and they really... It kind of shows. I mean, uh, in in hundred hundred quantities, this is in the twenty five dollar range. I think it starts to drop a little more up up above that. Um, but it's not that unusual. The DAC, the comparison is the DAC ninety eight eighty one from TI, and that's about a twenty dollar part as well. So you know, when you're paying, when you're getting eighteen bits, I think there's an ADI part as well that's at eighteen bits, and it's pretty far up there. When you're getting eighteen bits, it's uh, it gets expensive. And and to be honest. Doing 18 bits is not easy. Um, I always thought, oh, well, 18 bits on an ADC is easy, right? Well, you don't always get to integrate on the output of a DAC, whereas you know you can get 18 bits pretty easily if you integrate on the input to a sigma delta, right? So this is a lot more impressive. You need precision components internally. You need, you know, if you're doing, it's, I, don't, I don't believe it's a resistive ladder, but if you're doing any kind of DAC outputs, or if you've done it before, you know that there's, there's a couple different methods of doing it, and none of them really lend themselves to very high precision stuff. You need some kind of servoing action and you need, uh, you know, you need precision components in order to do it properly. Um, but this has it. I mean, this has, uh, what is it, two bit, uh, plus or minus two LSBs of INL and one LSB of DNL. And that's over the full, full temperature range. And basically it only has an output drift of 0.5 ppm per degree C. And if you're doing air budgets, that can really, uh, you know, that can affect your bottom line pretty, pretty, pretty significantly. So, this is this is a nice part. I mean, it really is, and, and it shows in the price. But 
like I said, it, it's not unusual for the for the other ones that are out there. And I think this one actually integrates more stuff. Um, other things it has, uh, safe power up. That's great for DAX because if you're doing, say you have an amplifier on the output of this thing, and maybe your DAC is only you know outputting a little bit of current, right? It, this thing can only drive about a 2K load, I believe. It can, uh, let's see, it can drive a 2K load, but a 10K and in parallel with 100 puff, it can actually settle at three microseconds. But in the, to say 2K load is, is the max it's gonna drive, um, that's not much, right? <laughs> if you actually wanna drive anything significant, uh, you need a much, uh, you need much better drive capabilities than this thing can handle. Um, so what you do is you'd hook this up to an out, uh, to an amplifier, and then you'd have you know some kind of feedback system that would you know come back around and actually servo the DAC, um, maybe an ADC that then uh, if it's a digital control loop or maybe there's some kind of analog control loop in there. Regardless, um, basically this thing is not going to be able to drive a whole lot of current on its own, but DACs are never really meant for that kind of thing. Um, so the nice thing, the feature I'm trying to get at here is this has a power-up mode that allows you to power up at zero or half scale. Now, why is that important? Well, if you have a 100-watt amplifier on the output of this thing, which might be a little extreme, but say you had a 100-watt amplifier on the output of this thing, if it powers up at full scale, right, you turn on your digital device and the DAC then turns on and it goes to full scale, well, then you're outputting 100 watts. And that could be bad. That could be a really bad time if you're just turning on your radio and, or your stereo and this thing, you know, goes to oblivion, uh, that would wake you up pretty quickly. <laughs> so uh, instead, this has you know default zero or half scale, half scale being for if you're actually doing a, a bipolar range where you're actually, you know, half scale on the DAC is actually the zero for a you know, plus minus 10 volt range, whatever it is. So that's, that's a nice little feature in there. Uh, rail to rail output, again, I said 2K. Overall, this is you know this is a very nice part. It's a four and a half by seven by eight millimeter part, twenty four pin TSOP, and you know if if you have a test and measurement application or some other kind of application and a little bit of change in your pocket, I'd suggest checking this out from Maxim Integrated. So that's all for this week on ChipReport.tv. Hope you enjoyed it. All the different parts. Uh, like I said, kind of back to the big boys: TI, LT, Maxim Integrated. Not exactly small companies, but again with the the amount of parts they're outputting, it's always fun to see what they're coming up with. So, in the meantime, until we wait for the next part to come out, please uh, give us a thumbs up on YouTube and subscribe if you'd like. Check out the forums at forums.chipreport.tv. We'll see you next time.